Our region has been doing this for years with phosphorus control in Idaho and Eastern Washington and parts of Oregon, nitrogen control for our reclaimed water systems and in the lower Puget Sound. And with a renewed focus on controlling nitrogen in the Puget Sound region, this topic is very apt today. While nutrient management and control can be intimidating for owners, operators, and engineers alike, today's presentations will feature a range of nutrient-related topics, from regulations and nutrient management to operational insights and emerging technologies, all to help shed light on this complex topic. So before we get started, I do want to take a few minutes to say thanks to the PNCWA board for helping create these events and provide valuable education to our sector and especially to Ellie Ott for her hard work in putting the seminar series together and create a session focused on the important topic of nutrients. Thank you also to our sponsors. Our gold sponsors are Brown and Caldwell, Corolla, Jacobs, West Yost, Leeway Engineering Services, Sladen, HDR, Tetra Tech, and Kennedy Jenks. Our silver sponsors for this event are Mead and Hunt, Parametrics, and Stantec. And our bronze sponsor for this event is Burger. Thanks to all of our speakers for all your effort in making this summit series a success. And lastly, thank you to all you attendees, because without you, we wouldn't be able to have a summit. If you aren't already a member of PNCWA, we do invite you to join to get access to our resources, along with access to the Water Environment Federation materials. If you're interested, you can also join a committee like the Emerging Technologies Committee to get more involved. Now, a quick overview of the sessions. Attendees are muted for these sessions. Feel free to use the chat. It won't disrupt the speakers and it's where you should post your questions should you have them for the speakers. If you do have a question, I ask that you lead it with either a cue or the word question so we know it's a question for our speakers and I can pull them out. A CEU poll with pop-ups will occur during the sessions. Please ensure that you answer these questions so that we can track your participation and you can get your CEUs. Also, if you're connected, please tweet your comments during the event at to at PNCWA.org, and they'll show up in the Twitter feed in the platform. We will have a four to five minute break between each of our sessions to give you some time to move from one platform into the other. There will also be a networking break in the middle of the summit, and again, one at the end where you can chat with either individuals or a group. There were instructions emailed to you on this on how to get into those uh, individual and group chats. Once you do have start a chat, you will have the option to opening a uh, video for that chat. Lastly, if you enjoy the event, I do encourage you to sign up for the remaining four. The next one is leadership and workforce development on November 18th. So now that we have that out of the way, I'd like to invite our first, uh, I'd like to give an intro to our first speaker. We're still uh, waiting for him to join the system a bit here, but uh, I, I will provide Brent a, a little bit of an intro. Our first speaker is Brent Dale. Uh, Brent received his bachelor's degree in environmental engineering from Oregon State University in 2014. Uh, he's also worked uh, within the industry, uh, consulting industry, since graduation until recently returning to pursue his master's degree at the University of Idaho. Brent will be presenting on operator insight in biological phosphorus removal. Uh, Brent's co-author uh, for this is Dr. Eric Coates at the University of Idaho. So we are just waiting for Brent to join. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to um, go ahead and ask them in the chat right now. Uh, we are just waiting for Brent in a minute, for a minute. It looks like Brent will be joining us very shortly here. Again, if there's any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, we do have uh, panelists on that, uh, and that I can start to direct some questions to. Uh, if there are any questions to start, we are just waiting for Brent to join the system.
Okay, it looks like we've got Brent joining now. Brent should be on shortly. And he will be beginning his presentation on operator insights to phosphorus removal. All right. I'm here. So I guess, uh, should I get started? All right. So uh, I missed the intro, but uh, yeah, I'm Brent Dale, and uh, I'll be covering some interesting findings from a survey sent out to several water resource recovery facilities that are practicing BPR in hopes to gain some of their operators insight on maintaining and recovering BPR. Next slide. So for this presentation, uh, the main topics we'll be covering is a quick introduction to myself and my co-author, Dr. Eric Coates. We'll go through some basics of BPR that are key to understanding the implications and my interpretations of the findings from the survey. We'll touch on the survey itself, how it was conducted, who it was sent to, and who participated. Then we'll get into some of the highlights from the survey, um, which was broken into a quantitative analysis, and then some uh, a compilation of qualitative operational feedback. And finally, we'll just highlight again some of the key takeaways and lessons learned. Next slide. So I'm Brent Dale. I'm a licensed professional engineer. I got my BS in environmental engineering from Oregon State in 2014. I've been working as a consulting engineer primarily since then. And currently working on my master's of science at the University of Idaho with Dr. Eric Coates, who was a co-author on this and a huge help and support for conducting the survey and figuring out what all of it meant. He's a professor of environmental engineering at the U of I and as well as a practicing consulting engineer. Next slide. So some of the basics of BPR. PAOs are the phosphorus accumulating organisms, which um, complete biological phosphorus removal, as their name implies. One of the keys to uh, BPR is cycling these PAOs through an anaerobic aerobic cycle. This induces within the PAOs a metabolism to uptake and store phosphorus. A key point within the anaerobic zone is that there is no dissolved oxygen or nitrate or nitrite. If any of these are present, it's no longer actually anaerobic and that metabolism to uptake P won't be induced within the PAOs. BFAs have been found to be key to BPR as well. They're volatile fatty acids. Um, and we'll just leave it at that for this presentation. B as anybody who has dug into PPR knows, BPR can be complicated. And we could dive into any one of these topics much more thoroughly and get into the nuances and the caveats of all of it. But the point of this survey or the intention was to keep things simple so that they would be more, the findings would be more universally applicable to different facilities practicing BPR rather than getting into very specific concepts and um, issues. Um, so real quick, we'll just go through this diagram so that you have an image in your head as we're talking through these things. Uh, this is a simple, about as simple as a BPR process can get. It's the anaerobic oxic process. So just an anaerobic basin feeding an aerobic. The primary treatment feeds into the anaerobic zone and that primary uh, water can contain various concentrations of VFAs. 
Some facilities also have a primary solids fermenter and the VFA concentration within the, the effluent of that fermenter can be quite high, which is typically while they're used in BPR systems. So both those go into the anaerobic zone, which then feeds into the aerobic zone and not part of BPR, but also happening aerobically, ammonia is being converted to nitrate and nitrate. Aerobic feeds in the secondary clarifier, which settles out the sludge that's then returned back to the anaerobic zone. Uh, secondary clarifier also releases the secondary effluent, which I'd like to point out here has the secondary TP and secondary TP was used as one of the main responses within the quantitative analyses. And it is defined as the total phosphorus concentration leaving the secondary treatment system before any chemical additions, filtration, or other tertiary treatments. Um, next slide. So as I mentioned, the intention of this survey was to get operators insight on BPR, uh, what they think is working, what they don't think is working, and, and then do an overall comparison of different facilities. I think it's important to point out that we should take these results uh, with a bit of, with a grain of salt. Um, this, the data that was collected in this was not necessarily amenable to black and white interpretations and took some of my own subjectivity to come up with well, ideas of why certain correlations occurred. Um, so it's not meant to upend any basics of current theories any basics of VPR or current theories out there. It's just meant to shed light where operators need it according to their responses. So the survey itself was sent out to 40 different facilities. We received responses from 20 of them, which the facilities were primarily located in Western North America, from Arizona all the way up to British Columbia, and then uh, one out in Virginia. The size of these facilities ranged dramatically from less than a million gallons a day to over 90. And the average secondary TP concentration, which I pointed out um, the definition to earlier, ranged from 0.15 to 1.1 milligrams per liter. And the facilities overall averaged 93% TP recovery biologically which I think helps to demonstrate the validity of BPR as a pea removal technique uh, for a wide range of facilities and climates. Next slide. So jumping into the quantitative analyses, the approach taken was to use two different response variables and compare those with several explanatory variables. Um, the first response variable was aimed at getting BPR consistency or reliability, and that was quantified using frequency of failure or frequency of BPR process upset. So what is BPR failure? Well, that was subjective to the respondents, and that was somewhat intentional um, as a way to get operators insight on how well they feel their BPR system is working and they know their systems better than anybody else, and um, they know when the system is headed towards uh, failure. So while the, the operators didn't necessarily use the same specific indicator, um, they were all unified by having the same end goal of maintaining their total phosphorus permit limit. So if they start to see concentrations out of the ordinary, no matter where they're being checked or what that specific concentration is, um, they might turn that a failure. And these failures ranged from less than once a year for the more successful facilities to uh, monthly with constant seasonal failures for those that are struggling with BPR, which this survey was most aimed at helping. The other response variable was BPR capacity, and that was quantified using the average secondary TP effluent. So that was uh, TP leaving the secondary system before any polishing. The two statistical approaches used um, for the quantitative portion, 
the for yes or no answers, an analysis of variance was used, which yields p-values, which indicate whether the the yeses and the nos are statistically different. For numerical answers, just a simple linear regression um, and an R-squared value to indicate whether or not the explanatory and the response were related. Next slide. So jumping into some of the highlights from the quantitative portion, the most interesting finding to me probably from this survey was uh, this first one. And those facilities that had a presence of a total nitrogen permit limit actually experienced less frequency of failures than facilities without a total nitrogen permit limit. And this one has got me thinking about what is the difference between facilities with a total nitrogen permit and those without. And the main difference seems to be that those that have to manage nitrogen for their permit are going to be managing it much more strictly and getting rid of more nitrogen um, from their system. So they're incor likely incorporating post-anoxic basins or at least pre-anoxic, um, maybe having an addition of carbon to push that denitrification further. Um, but in short, uh, this is most important for nitrates that could potentially be recycled back to the anaerobic basin. So facilities with that TN permit limit are going to be removing more of that nitrate and allowing less to be recycled within the RAS to their anaerobic basin. Um, the presence of that total nitrogen permit limit didn't seem to impact uh, the secondary TP concentrations, which indicates that uh, the presence of nitrate is potentially more impactful uh, as a failure or more noticeable as a failure than it is simply a fluctuation in secondary TP, which I think is important to keep in mind um, when looking at the impacts of nitrate. The next uh, characteristic here was total phosphorus permit limit values and facilities with a lower TP permit tended to have a lower secondary TP, which seems to seems potentially obvious at first take, but then if, if we think about it a little bit more, why would a facility with a lower TP permit have lower secondary TP? And I still don't actually have an answer to that question, um, but I think it's interesting that facilities that are pushed to lower their TP permit are actually able to do so by uh, biological means rather than purely tertiary means. Um, there are those facilities also that are pushing their biological TP aren't necessarily doing so at the cost of failures to their system. The next one here is uh, influent wastewater. We asked about several influent wastewater characteristics. Um, and found no statistically significant relationship between any of them, uh, which indicates that BPR is not necessarily uh, just characterized by influent uh, concentrations. Um, however, we didn't ask about spikes and how often they see spikes in nutrients or toxics. Uh, that was kind of considered out of the scope of this survey. Next slide. So BPR facilities can have a wide range of unique unit processes, and I was curious what the impacts of these are on the BPR system. So the first and potentially most obvious one was a primary solids fermenter. So as I pointed out in that diagram earlier, some facilities have these fermenters, uh, typically in order to increase the loads of BFAs going into the anaerobic basin. And BFAs are a good thing for BPR. So it was thought that a fermenter would have a correlation with either good, less frequency of failures or a lower secondary TP, but the opposite was actually found. 
those facilities with a fermenter tended to have a higher average secondary P TP and frequency of failure. However, these, um, these numbers weren't actually statistically significant, but the fact that the facilities with a fermenter didn't have any benefits shown within this analysis um, was surprising and makes me wonder about uh, if there is a lack of understanding and maybe research on how to use a fermenter to benefit DPR. The second unit process looked at was the anaerobic digester and um, digesters tended to increase secondary TP, which is not necessarily surprising because the effluent from digesters is rich in phosphorus, it can be. It didn't seem to increase the frequency of failure, which may indicate that operators, since they have con more control of these digesters and know when this increase in phosphorus is going to hit their system, they can either adjust it or maybe they just don't term it a failure because they know why it happened. Um, side stream P recovery and influent equalization both decreased secondary total phosphorus, which makes sense because a side stream P recovery system is going to remove phosphorus that would otherwise be recycled through the system. And influent equalization is just going to offer some overall stability to the system, cut down on any peak loads of uh, nutrients or toxics as well as flows. Uh, there did not seem to be a relationship with frequency of failure for either one of those. Next slide. Some of the operational parameters looked at, uh, SRT, HRT, RAS rate, facility layout, there didn't seem to be any significant uh, relationships with these and secondary TP and failures. So there didn't, no golden numbers were found or facility layouts. However, the percent anaerobic volume, which has often been termed the anaerobic mass fraction, did correlate with less frequency of failure. Um, the most successful facilities in terms of failures had an anaerobic volume that was at least 15% of their total biological system. Um, years of BPR operation also led to a decrease in frequency of failure. This could be due to the longer a system is practicing BPR, the more opportunity they have to work the kinks out of their system and to, to learn how to manipulate it to match different influent flows and concentrations. Um, however, no relationship with secondary TP. Next slide. So jumping into some of the more qualitative uh, feedback, some common operational approaches. This one was surprising to me and that um, this occurred from several different facilities. They mentioned an ideal mixed liquor concentration of 2,000 to 2,500 for maintaining consistent BPR. And this was surprising to me because I typically work in a world of SRTs for design, um, but it doesn't seem to be that SRTs are correlated with consistent or high capacity BPR. Instead, operators are more focused on what the mixed liquor concentration is. Uh, and they suggest adjusting this to match any changes within influent characteristics. Um, Operators again mentioned the importance of minimizing RAS nitrate. So not only do we see it within the quantitative analysis, this importance of nitrogen, specifically nitrates in the RAS, um, but operators are also mentioning it. And uh, op several operators mentioned the importance of managing their sludge blanket level, but there wasn't there didn't seem to be consistency in the ways that they did this. Some are successful having a zero blanket policy, or if they start to see any formation of a sludge blanket, then they uh, adjust processes to get rid of it, like increasing the RAS rate to flush it out, while others utilize those sludge blankets and maintain a small one within the secondary clarifier 
in part to minimize RAS nitrates and to take advantage of a, another anoxic or anaerobic zone. Uh, another suggestion from operators for maintaining consistent BPR is to set the aerobic DO to a minimum for nitrification. And this could have a couple impacts. It could increase simultaneous nitrification and denitrification, um, leading to less uh, nitrates within the RAS. Can also minimize DO within the RAS and within the internal recycle or mixed liquor return. Um, all of those potentially decreasing nitrates. Next slide. So some of the troubleshooting guidance that operators uh, gave was that if nitrates are noticed within the anaerobic zone, one potential way to cut back on this would be to slow the RAS rate and give sludge a little bit longer within the secondary clarifier to potentially uh, get rid of some of those nitrates. You may also want to add an external carbon source to an anoxic specific zone to drive further denitrification. If you're seeing phosphorus in the RAS um, uh, via secondary P release, you may want to check your sludge blanket level. It could be getting too thick and pushing the oxidative reduction potential and DO low. Uh, one way to get rid of that blanket would be to increase the RAS rate. But I wanna point out that phosphorus within the RAS is not necessarily bad. In fact, some operators look for a small release in phosphorus. And I think that's to indicate that that sludge has gone fully anaerobic and is ready as soon as it hits the anaerobic basin to perform BPR. Uh, if you're having intermittent failures, of course, this is a much harder one to pin down. A couple of pieces of advice that operators gave us to perform a toxic analysis of industrial dischargers or potentially looked for sludge that could be trapped within your system um, going through endogenous decay and releasing phosphorus in an area you don't want to see it released. Next slide. So key takeaways. For me, the most important thing that came out of this was the importance of managing nitrate in the RAS specifically. We see that highlighted over and over again with these different operational approaches, as well as in that quantitative analysis. Those facilities with a TN permit limit are having less frequency of failure than those without. So it may benefit operators to operate as if they have a TN permit limit and really track nitrogen, specifically nitrate throughout the system. Um, if you're having trouble with nitrate recycling in the RAS, you may want to consider maintaining a small sludge blanket. Um, and this for me is actually steering further research. I'm digging into how RAS rates can be used to, um, to potentially reduce that nitrate load to the anaerobic basin. The other thing that kind of stumped me on this was the impacts of primary solids fermenters and has got me wondering how much they actually benefit BPR and how best should we be operating them. There's a lot of research on how to operate fermenters in order to get uh, specific VFAs and the highest concentration of VFAs. There's a lot of research on what the best VFAs are for BPR but there isn't a lot of research on how to best utilize fermenters to enhance BPR, um, when to add liquor to the mainstream, at what frequency, how much. Um, these are all very complicated questions that I think need to be asked. Uh, a, another key takeaway was just how supportive operators within the wastewater industry are. Uh, throughout all of this survey, they were, no matter how busy they were or how big a facility they're working at, they were all happy to give me any feedback or answer any questions that I had going through this process. So I encourage um, 
other designers, academics, and operators to reach out to these experienced operators um, to get some very quality feedback. So a key lesson learned for me that it, doing this process was that it was it's very challenging to analyze qualitative feedback. It's hard enough for operators to condense their knowledge down on such a complicated topic to just a, a few sentences within a survey. And then it's a, it's a whole nother challenge for me to look for uh, interrelated themes between those responses. But even with some of the flaws within this research, I still believe that it brought up some interesting topics that could help lead to some beneficial conversations within the BPR community. Um, next slide. With that, I, I think I ended a little bit early, but I'd like to thank you for your time and I guess open up for some questions. Okay, thank you, Brent. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, we do have uh, plenty of time here for some questions for Brent. Um, I did get a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, the first question comes from Carol Nelson at King County. Uh, her question is for the facilities that process modeling may have been done, uh, did the um, were the findings of the process modeling consistent with the field observations that the plants were seeing? Hmm. Uh, we didn't actually ask, we didn't do process modeling of different facilities. Um, I don't think that we could have perform, performed process models to the level that they would need to be done um, for all these different facilities. And we didn't ask if they already had a process model and how well that correlated with what their system actually um, performs. So I think that's a great question for another round of surveys though. Okay, great. Uh, again, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Uh, another question that we have here is, what are some of the ways that we can reduce nitrate within the RAS? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of different ways, and I kind of pointed out some of those within the operational insight um, could potentially reduce nitrates within the whole system by having a carbon addition, introducing a post anoxic basin or a pre anoxic if that's not already there. Um, that maintaining of a sludge blanket can potentially introduce another anaerobic or an anoxic zone, which could reduce the nitrates recycled within the RAS. Um, and I think controlling of the RAS rate could be a way to manipulate how long sludge are in that secondary clarifier and potentially be used to reduce nitrates in the RAS. Okay, great. Uh, another question. Um, from Nigel Beaton with Corolla. Uh, did any of the surveyed facilities have tertiary phosphorus removal in addition to BPR? And if so, were the BPR operations different than those facilities that didn't have it? In other words, were they running mm. at a higher mixed liquor or allowing for denitrification in the sludge blanket, those types of things? So most of the facilities had some sort of tertiary removal in order to cover their butts if, uh, if they weren't getting the, the level of secondary TP that they needed, because a lot of these have very, a lot of these facilities had very strict phosphorus effluent limits. So they need that, uh, that backup, that safety net. For the, the second part of that question, I'm not sure. I don't know. I didn't dig into whether or not uh, facilities with that tertiary treatment are actually operating differently. Um, my feeling from digging through the answers is that no, not uh, not at a, not to a black and white degree. Um, you know, some of them maybe, but not all of them. Okay. Uh, another question from John Gassick. Uh, do any of the BPR plants use alum to enhance phosphorus removal? And if so, how did that factor into the BPR operations? 
I didn't ask what specific chemicals were used, um, but some offered up that they do have alum additions to their system um, as a tertiary means to get rid of some of that phosphorus. But um, yeah, I didn't get specific chemicals used from very many uh, facilities. That wasn't one of the questions within the survey. Okay. Uh, question from John Beecham. Uh, did you look for any correlation between the influent VFAs and the performance stability? Um, yeah, that's a good question, John. Um, but again, this was potentially one of the flaws of the survey. We were trying to keep things simple and not all facilities have the capacity to analyze VFAs within their system. And if they are, they could be only doing grab samples every now and then, which isn't necessarily indicative of what the real VFA concentration going through their system is. So we didn't ask what VFA concentrations are in the, the wastewater. I think that that is potentially correlated with good BPR. It's hard to know. Okay, great. Uh, again, keep asking your questions in the, in the feed loop chat. Um, another question here, uh, how can we participate in this survey uh, if we weren't a participant previously? So my email was on that last slide there. Um, please shoot me an email and I will give you the survey and incorporate your responses within it. Uh, we're trying to compile all these results into a potential pub or at least something that those people that did respond can have and use and see all the different uh, responses and the summary of that. Okay, uh, another quick question from Michelle Maganis. Um, what were the survey questions and how were survey participants uh, selected? Uh, I can't go through all the questions here. There's just not time in this, um, but uh, how were they selected? They were, the questions were selected through conversations between myself, uh, Dr. Coates, as well as some operators that we know in the Moscow region, just coming up with uh, what questions can we ask in order to get the most insight on BPR and how operators are managing it and what impacts it. Um, so it was just a lot of brainstorming sessions and refinement after refinement of the survey. Okay, uh, another question. Um, for the operator insight that MLSS was more important, uh, why, why do you think the operators felt that? Was it a um, just a misunderstanding of what SRT control is, or is there really a correlation between mixed liquor concentration and the performance of these systems? I think um, that operators keep track of mixed liquor more so because it's straightforward. The calculation for SRT um it has a lot more going on in it whereas operators tend to have online monitoring of their mixed liquor so they have instantaneous view of what their mixed liquor concentration is rather than trying to calculate through their um, through their wastage rates what their srt is so and again when we look at those quantitative analysis the there wasn't a a golden SRT across facilities, but there was a concentration of mixed liquor that seemed to um, be applicable to a lot of different facilities. So why that is, I think is a good question that we, we should dig into a little bit further. Okay. Um, again, are there any other questions? Please type them into the chat. Uh, we don't have any current questions at this time. I'll give it another minute. And then uh, we'll say thanks to Brent one more time. Okay, I'm not really seeing any more questions coming in. Uh, I just wanna say 
Thank you, Brent. Uh, very nice job on your presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes till the start of the next session. Uh, don't forget that you'll need to go back into sessions and select the next session uh, in order to uh, move into that next session where we'll be talking with Dr. Keaton Lesnick uh, uh, on, on um, instrumentation and phosphorus control. So thank you again, Brent, and uh, we'll take a quick break to go into the next session. All right, thanks all.